Welcome back! In the last video we talked about the early and middle stages of Dacian history without really looking at what really meant to be Dacian and what stood out about them. I mentioned last video that I had to resort to cut it short last minute because I wanted to respect the deadline. Therefore, if you found my accounts a bit superficial, you will probably change your mind after watching this second part. Oh, and if you haven't watched the first part yet, I strongly recommend it. That being said, let's go! Decipalus was one of the greatest and best documented Dacian kings. He came to power in 86 AD, right after the great Dacian victory over General Cornelius Foscus. After his general was defeated, the Domination was forced into accepting the Dacian terms for peace. Decebalus freed the Roman prisoners of war in exchange for some Roman engineers who helped them build advanced fortifications and brought the first siege artillery in Dacia. Decebalus was recognized as the Dacian king and was given 8 million sesterces a year to let Rome alone. Decebalus used his new wealth and fame to extend his influence all over Dacia. This was the Dacian golden age. Before we move on with more war talk, let's talk about the Dacian society. First of all, Dacia was very rich of resources. The north was filled with mines of metal, precious or not, and the south was very fertile. The Dacians practiced agriculture, apiculture, viticulture, produced livestock, ceramics, and were experts in metalwork. They even used their metal to make coins. They didn't have their own currency, instead they imitated other currencies such as the Macedonian silver coins and the Roman denarii. Today this will count as counterfeit, but at the time, as long as it was the same amount of metal, they didn't care. Dacians were also advanced enough in terms of architecture to the point of having their own style. The Muro statues style was mostly for fortifications but it was also used for other buildings. It adopted some Greek and Macedonian aspects but they still seem unique. What stands out is probably the big stones but I honestly can't tell. As we mentioned earlier the Dacians and Thracians were very close culturally speaking but there are a few things that divide them a lot. Two to be exact. Religion and language. The Dacian religion was a polytheist. What makes it stand out is the level of importance given to the priests who were often seen as kings or at least something very close to that. The language is also unique. There are many theories for what it really is but what we do know for sure is that it's Indo-European, had some relation to Thracian and the closest living relative to it is Albanian. Yet they are still very different. To what extent they were related to Thracian is highly debatable. Now let's talk about warfare. The weapon of excellence for the Dacian was the falx, which was a sword that had been bended at the tip. The reason they liked it so much was because it was great at breaking Roman shields. They varied in length and weight, but they all worked more or less the same way. There was a distinction though among the Dacian warriors, that was the rank. The nobles often wore a hat, called the Frisian cap, which was widespread all over Eastern Europe at the time. They even had names uh, for the social classes. The aristocracy was called the Tarabostes and the common people Comati. I hope you enjoyed this break as we're getting right back in the action right now. For almost 15 years, Dacia enjoyed relative peace. Decebalus used the Roman funds to raid the north, protect the south, and just mind his own business. In 98 AD, Emperor Trajan came to power, and he was such a hater. One of the first things he did was to increase fortifications in the area, and in 101 he decided to invade. Decebalus' first response was to negotiate, but Trajan refused, and so they met at the Battle of uh, Tepea. This was technically the second Battle of Tepea, but no one talked about that one because Rome lost in it. So anyway, back to the video. Decebalus was unprepared and in a numerical disadvantage, so he lost, but not without causing some serious losses. He then tried again to ambush Trajan at Adampishi. 
but he was no match and he had to give up. The Zibalas had to dismantle some forts and give up some territories around the Danube. He still kept the throne, but that was far from the end. In 105, the Zibalas reinforced his borders once again and attacked Moesia, retaking the land that he had lost, and some more. He even planned to assassinate Trajan by using some of his Dacian auxiliaries as spies. He didn't succeed, but he captured one of his close friends, Pompeius Longinus, who in order not to be used as an hostage, poisoned himself. Trajan was tired of Decebalus' bullshit, so he prepared a huge army and went straight to the Dacian capital, Sarmi Segetusa, sacking it in 106. Decebalus was able to escape, but he was captured some weeks after, and he killed himself. Unlike Vercingetorix and Boudica, who were enemies of Rome just like him, he was uh, actually respected by the Romans. The Trajan column, even if it was clearly a way for Trajan to flex on his conquest, had a lot of art and care put into it. This suggests that Dacians were not just looked down upon like some dirty barbarians, which is quite nice. Today, this Zibalus is seen as a great symbol of Romanian national unity, and so his memory lives on. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it and commenting any opinions and corrections. I'll be looking at Trajan next time, so be sure to stick around for that. Cheers, lads!